What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Sec Tech Podcast. We are so glad you are with us. You know, Ken, I always want to throw out like the episode number. Like this is episode, and I can I, I have no idea what episode we're on at this point. It's a lot now. We're we're doing really good. Yeah. You know, they they say that if a podcast makes it past ten episodes, you're doing good. And I think we're in like the twenties or thirties now. So. We've got to be right. Yeah, easily. <laughs> but uh, this is. Ken Williamson didn't even introduce him. Co-host extraordinaire. Hi. <laughs> and, and and Ken, you know, we were just talking about this a little bit off air. The transformation of Ken Williamson. You, <laughs> when we started this podcast, I mean, you could have been in Die Hard as the villain. Oh yeah. And I'm looking Hans. at you now. Yeah, you've got. I mean, the short hair. I mean, the the. I y- you've gone fully Hans over to like. Bruce Willis's sidekick, you mm. know what I mean? Like, like I could see you being like, you know, the utility guy who helped save the day at this point. You know what I mean? Well, that that's cool. I, I I'm in my redemption arc right now. <laughs> the, the, this is this is right before it turns out that it was all a lie and I was a villain all along. So that's you know what <laughs> I do think you're tricking us a little bit. Could be, but I'll tell you, it's funny you bring that up because last week uh, our producer Justine got on to me because for once you had a big change in your look and I didn't even mention it. Right, and, and now the beard's already back. Right, so missed opportunity on my part. Fully back, yeah, and you know that was uh, that was funny because that literally happened like that day, and that was. Um, I, I, dude, I haven't had my wife's never seen me without a beard yeah. until that day. And the only reason I didn't have a beard was because I have the same clippers that I've had since like college. It's, it's, it's not a good set. I really need to buy a new one. And the guards don't even like really stay on very well. And I just hack it, you know, to, to, to shave, you know, and, and, uh, I basically went, and that guard fell right off and just put a big hole in my beard. And I tried to patch it and there was just there was no answer. So had to had to shave it. And I'm very glad that the beard is back because man, it was it was tough. It was tough. Yeah. I, I, I assure you like barely recognize yourself in the mirror. You do I mean you looked a lot younger. That's you know, that's what I keep getting. And I'm like, okay, that you know, that that was good feedback at least. Good good to know that yeah. later when you're feeling like a little too old, just yeah. Kill the beard and you'll be young again. I like that. I like that. I'll have to try that when I turn 40 in <laughs> four years. Okay. Uh, <laughs> man, I am excited about today, man. I'm really excited about this episode. We get to nerd out, yes, um, which is I am awesome. <laughs> you know, we've, we, we have a lot of business professionals. Yeah, we have been doing a lot know? of people on the business side, mm-hmm. and, we, and we finally got a, a fellow uh, developer on the, on the show. And so I'm really excited as well. I think it's going to be really good. Yeah. Really cool guy, Eric Kyle and, um, Eric spent uh, a lot of years in lighting in production, live events, and uh, a lot like you and I, you know, came out of a career transitioned into software successfully and has been doing some really, really cool stuff. So I'm excited to talk about him, uh, or talk about him and to him, Today, it's going to be a phenomenal episode. We will be right back with our guest. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back. And joining us right now is Eric Kyle. Eric, it's so good to see you, man. I know... You've been in software now a few years. You and I actually started relatively around the same time, you know, three, four years. I know you have a lot of experience in the area, um, in software, uh, currently with uh, Clever. Um, man, tell us a little bit about what you're working on right now, man. What, what, yeah, what, what's going on in, in, in your universe, your tech universe right now? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so on the, you know, on the work front and the day job, uh, as you mentioned, I work for Clever, uh, which is a custom software shop out of OKC. Uh, and we do a, a broad variety of client work there. And I specifically, when I was transitioning, as you mentioned, I targeted doing some more client-based work because mm-hmm. uh, coming out of my previous life in live events, I liked the variety. And I knew while I was carrying a lot of tech experience in with me, we were going to be looking at you know a, a bit of a new industry paradigm. And the more sort of 
variety of things you can get thrown at you. And I kind of like the fire hose approach there. Yeah. Like the quicker you adapt to getting those intuitions about both industry norms, but also starting to identify things like common pitfalls and bottlenecks. And 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 that was a thing that, you know, having having decades of experience in a previous field that when I moved to a new field, I was like, okay, the skills are there, the technical understanding is there, but all this intuition I had built up about how things sort of worked in another industry, it was what I identified as, as being new to me. And so uh, really stoked working on all these variety of client projects. I've worked on uh, large projects across a bunch of sectors already in my time at Clever. Uh, we've done healthcare work. Uh, I'm currently working on an agriculture related project um, for the, the agriculture industry. Um, and, and government integration stuff there uh, and, and dealing with a lot of those sorts of processes. So a lot of the work we tend to do is, you know, finding clients that have somewhat established business practices or are looking to take something to the next level and figure out what both their roadblocks and hurdles are and also how we can kind of help them accelerate and then, you know, produce the products, whether that's enhancing something that they're bringing to us as an existing starting point or building something greenfield from the ground up for them. That's awesome, man. Um, so you originally, you, you know, you were in um, live events. You were doing a lot of lighting, audio, mm -hmm. you know, that type of stuff, right? Yes, sir. And what's interesting about that world in translation to software is that, like, if you've got an event and the event is in this arena and it's like 7, you know, it kicks off at 7 p.m., um, like, you got to be done, right? Like the lights got to be on, the the stage has to be set, the, it's got to be programmed. Like there's no like, oh man, you know, we missed the deadline. We'll start at nine o'clock now. You know, when you have like ten thousand people showing up, right? Yeah, no, no hot fixes on on live events. Yeah, none, right? <laughs> at least none. You hope anybody notices. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, the the saying that that I always heard with with lighting and sound was. You know, you did your job when nobody is thinking about you, right? Hundred yeah. percent. I didn't get mentioned in a review. I did a good job. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you're you're transitioning over to software, and you just kind of hit on it, right? There's a lot of subtle complexities to software. We've all experienced them. Um, you know, whenever you get into a software project, um, whether it was the scope of work at the beginning was just really far off, or there was just something that the the um, discovery process didn't reveal that's going to end up being a major hurdle. Like there's a lot of things and all of a sudden now it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, we were supposed to be done in 90 days and now it's 180 days. And now, you know, um, talk to me a little bit about just, yeah, just that transition from a world where it was like, we're going live and you're either like you did your job or you didn't into a world where there's just more ambiguity to like, when is this supposed to be done? What does delivery actually mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, uh, and and one that I've definitely been dealing with a lot with in terms of of my you know professional growth in this field. Uh, I think I would say like on one hand, coming over from that previous experience in live events, uh, I used to talk in job interviews and things when I was transitioning about the fact that I'm clearly not scared about a tight budget or a strict deadline. That like. I'm used to that. Yeah. So anytime we've ever had a client or a project where there really is some kind of at least approach at a hard deadline, as you've already pointed out, that hard deadline is still not as hard at 7.30 p.m. I used to joke that we don't sell tickets to launch, right? Yeah. Like that's not a thing that you usually do. And in the theater, you often are selling those tickets six months before. Like, so it's a, the software equivalent would be, we're gonna start building an app. Let's go ahead and sell tickets to launch before we write the first line of code. Mm -hmm. And then like, we know we'll be done at that date because you kind of have to, work in those cycles. And so, as you mentioned, that that sort of ambiguity or flexibility like has manifested itself for a couple of ways uh, uh, for me as, as both challenges and, and kind of exciting things. You know, one, one there is that notion that, that it is adaptable in most cases where if the client needs change, if the project needs change, you have the ability to adjust that schedule without having to suddenly, you know, refund all your tickets and resell mm -hmm. them kind of thing, right? So that flexibility to do what's right for the project or the client, I think, has been really nice. Um, at the same time, like because I am used to having to work on those tight deadlines and schedules with a large team that all has to be sort of synchronized on those, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to you know add into the pool of of tools with my colleagues is is really strong collaborative process communication. And as you mentioned, like when you're dealing with those ambiguities, I think that's that's the core thing right there uh, is communication. If 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 you your project team, your project manager, product owners, the clients customers aren't on the same page about expectations about what's happening, especially 
if those parameters are shifting, then you're bound to have mismatches of expectations and realities, mm -hmm. right? And as soon as we have that mismatch, then somebody's going to be disappointed or work is going to be spent in the wrong place. Um, and, you know, for me, that's turned into both, you know, emphasizing really core communication skills, but also leaning hard into questions. I'm a big, like, questions are one of my favorite things humanity has managed to craft. Um, and so I think, like, leaning into questions and staying in the, like, identifying the problem space for longer than we, I think we often have a tendency to want to jump to solutions. Yeah. And then kind of try to bend the problem or the solution back into shape. Mm, and I think, like, interesting, yeah. I've been trying to bias towards, like, let's spend just a little more time talking about the problem. I know, like, everybody's antsy to get going, but... Uh, you know, I think it, it was speciously attributed to Einstein, and I don't know who actually said it, but there was a uh, quote supposedly that he said, if you, if you gave me an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on it, I would spend the first 55 minutes making sure I was answering the right question. Mm -hmm. And, like, I think that's a, that's a mentality that I try to take into, like, I'm leading projects now at Clever, and as a team lead, that's a, like, are we, are we doing the most impactful thing for our client and the product we can at any right. given moment? And if we're not, we need to stop and talk about what that is. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's so great. You know, we, we mentioned in the intro that we've had a lot of business people on. And, you know, I think that the paradigm is shifting away from the idea of the, you know, lone wolf programmer that's off in a cave somewhere and you just feed them requirements and get an app back, you know. And, and I think the business is coming around and developers are coming around to exactly what you're saying, which is that a lot more collaborative process. And, and I really loved what you said about spending more time in identifying the problem space. And, and my sense is that really in software, you, you can't ever get away from that because it, like you said, it's not usually a, we need a hard launch at seven. Sometimes it is, but most of the time there is some wiggle room there and it's much better to launch the product correctly and solve the right problem than it is to be on time. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, at least in my view, you know, and maybe, maybe other people disagree. So I, I, I think that's all great, but you know, since we have a developer here, I kind of wanted to get a little bit down into some, some tech details. Sure. Um, so I, I, if you don't mind, do you have a, uh, a uh, favorite technology stack that you're using? Do you use different ones for different projects or is there one that you're the most skilled with? It's it's uh, a little bit of both is the answer there. Um, so uh, part of what I loved bringing from my theater background is a sort of, I used to joke that stagehands are all kind of recovered pirates. Like that's really what we are. <laughs> I mean, the, the rigging systems and stuff in theater are all come from sailing ships and, and all of that sort of thing. And there's this mentality that I think you see a lot with farmers. It's on my mind because I'm working on an agricultural product or with sailors, whereas like you're, you're stuck in a confine where you just have to figure out how to make something work within the constraints that you have, you know? And, uh, so to that extent, like the right tool for the job is the right tool. And that trumps any personal preferences I mm -hmm. have. And I feel the same way about teams. My, my, my rule on team projects is like, uh, we can argue about linters or formatters or whatever all day, but as long as we, the, the rule is the project rule, like we're going to set a set of standards for the project and we're all going to do the same thing because that fosters that collaboration and communication. We don't want to yeah. have to reinvent our rule sets every time we talk about a project, but that can absolutely change from project to project. So um, at work, at Clever, uh, our, our main stack for most of our, uh, we're, we're fairly web heavy and our web dominant stack is usually a, a Laravel backend with a Vue front end. Um, most of the time we are doing a lot of filament and live wire stuff as well now. Um, and then we do also have a fair number of enterprise type uh, C-sharp.net stack um, projects. And that's kind of probably our two core stacks at work. Um, I work mostly in the Laravel view stack. And so if I'm building web stuff these days, I mean, it, those are familiar with Laravel. It's a, you know, opinionated batteries included heavyweight framework. So if you kind of want to do something in a web app, it's kind of baked in, or there's a strong ecosystem around that. And so for any web work, even, uh, you know, personal or freelance stuff, I've kind of leaned into just using that stack because it's kind of interchangeable with Django or Rails or whatever else, anything in that flavor. Um, but also noting that that is opinionated and full of magic, as I like to call it, right? Like they love yeah. to lean into PHP's magic method forwarding and all this right. other sort of stuff. So it's like, ooh, three lines of code and I have auth and all this stuff, right? I, to try to stay in touch with the, like, you know, I mentioned previous background in like embedded hardware stuff and mucking around with like low level tech and kind of having to hack it together as we went. I wanted to make sure that I was keeping touch with both upskilling and just thinking about processes on kind of lower systems levels that often get abstracted away in those high end, high, high level web frameworks. Um, so for most of my personal work, uh, my, my current 
love of labor or labor of love for the last two years has been Rust. Nice. Um, so I've been digging hard into Rust. And so basically anything I build for myself outside of work, I build it in Rust, even if Rust isn't the right tool for the job, just to make right. me use Rust. So currently I'm actually rebuilding my personal site and blog and stuff as an experiment and building a full stack web app entirely in Rust end to end. So it's uh, Wasm JS front end. Yeah. Um, and then trying to deal with the challenges also that I've given myself of like <clears throat> making that work if the user disables JS or Wasm, right? Because it's cool to have all the new technologies, but I also want to acknowledge people who don't necessarily have access to the best technologies yeah. or for privacy or security reasons don't have that stuff enabled. And I think, you know, if you've got something like a simple blog, that thing should read and load without JS or Wasm or anything fancy, right? And so, yeah. but playing with those technologies has been fun. So that gives me that systems level balance to the high level stuff. And, and I also has applications for embedded hardware. I think I'm kind of tired of writing C for that stuff. So, right, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, man, you 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 said a lot there. So maybe maybe we spend a little bit of unta uh, uh, a time unpacking it. So you you mentioned Laravel. One thing I wanted to ask is, I I, I have never gotten into the PHP ecosystem at all. Mm -hmm. um, my my closest thing is that for friends for fun. Um, I've, I've done some WordPress editing and like a little bit of custom PHP and WordPress. And, um, so I, I'm interested to hear more about your thoughts about the language and the framework. Um, because what I've heard is that like, it's kind of, I, I, and I've heard this for a long time. So obviously there's some sort of disconnect, but I've heard that it's kind of on the way out that other technologies are better. Um, you know, there are maybe better tools that have the same level of out of the box capability, um, you know, but that are, are, um, you know, people talk about a lot about node and express as, mm -hmm. as being something that is, has a similar level of out of the box magic, but then also, you know, has a lot uh, of plugins and stuff. So what, what do you think about all that? Are, are you, um, sensing that it's on the way out or does, does that seem a little far-fetched? I don't, I don't think it is. I mean, it depends on the time scale. maybe we're looking at, right? Sure. Like there's always ebbs and flows in technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, it certainly isn't, uh, evolving at the state at the scale or pace that the JavaScript ecosystem does. That is both a good and a bad thing, right? One of the things mm -hmm. I love about the Rust ecosystem is I don't have a new package to do the same thing every three weeks. And that's kind of nice. They tend to, you know, I find the same thing. I work in Go occasionally too. And Go's ecosystem is similar in that you have less options but the options are usually kind of better vetted and more iterated on. And so, you know, there, there's that trade-off. My first stack when I was transitioning in this field was React, TypeScript, Node, backends. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've worked quite a bit in that ecosystem as well. Um, and I think they just, there, there's trade-offs to both. Um, and it really is a lot of that I think is options, right? Like there's a million options for any, you want a date picker <laughs> for React, like you can go find 30 of them right now. Yeah, right, and, right. Good luck finding the good one, right? Like you have to do all that vetting, but also you're gonna have plenty of options. You know, and in the the PHP system ecosystem, I think these days for modern stuff is kind of more similar in some ways to what I was mentioning about Rust or Go, which is you have less options, but some of those options have been around for a while and like actually had some work put into them. Um, I, I do draw a distinction. It, your, the PHP history you mentioned is interesting because my first in, in, interaction with PHP was like way back in the early days, I'm gonna date myself right now, like building stuff on GeoCities back in the day. I'm like, <laughs> Um, early, early web when I was like, you know, in high school mucking around with the early days of the internet and just building simple web pages. Um, and I thought PHP was, it made no sense to me. It was a kind of not my favorite language. The, the paradigm seemed all over the place. And so when I started working at Clever and saw that we were doing Laravel, I actually had some of the same concerns you addressed and were uh, mentioned. And I will say, I think nowadays there's two things going on. One, I think there's a substantial distinction between Laravel development and like native raw PHP development. Right. Laravel as part of the framework has instituted a lot of helpers and facades to wrap up some of the kind of clunky bits of PHP in ways that are a lot more similar to some of those other modern frameworks. And so I think in some ways it hides some of the remaining warts on PHP. The, the other thing that I would say that I've noticed is that um, as of PHP 7.5 or so, and we're on 8.3 now, um, there seems to have been a pretty concerted effort compared to what I was used to from the old days of PHP about how the language is getting developed and features are getting added. Right. It felt like in the early days of PHP, there was a lot of like, sure, chuck this in there and chuck that in there. And if you look at things like, I don't know, their array methods, the function signatures, the arguments are in different orders for no apparent reason and that kind of thing. Um, and and nowadays, they, you know, we've gotten native type hints in there now, which actually like you don't need a separate typing library to actually do type assertions and uh, things like uh, enums 
which like are a staple of most programming languages to me, like PHP has those now and they're all baked in. And so there seems to be a kind of concerted effort from the, the foundation that works on PHP to have actually thought about the future iterations of the language yeah. and be growing and adding some modern functionality. Um, WordPress is kind of its own animal and we don't do much WordPress and I don't do much WordPress and WordPress does one thing extremely well, which is you need like a blog-esque content focused thing where a non-technical user can edit their own schemas. I think they still probably do that better than anybody else. Yeah. When you right. want to hand the control off to the user, like for all the schema editing and stuff, they, they've kind of nailed that. And for some reason, nobody else has seemed to provide a similar user experience to that. But for- yeah. And I think, you know, I, so I've used Laravel a little bit when I first started in software, you know, I did about a, four or five month internship at a, um, it was kind of like a a WordPress shop, but there was some stuff in Laravel. And um, I, you know, I really liked it, but I don't know if I found, and it could have just been my experience kind of being newer in software. I don't know if I found the, the out of the gate, like the heaviness of, of, you know, the, the amount of options and features. I don't know if I found it as, um, easy to grab and customize as if I just wrote whatever I needed from scratch in like a C sharp, you know? Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's always been now, again, I don't have a ton of experience there, but that was always my experience. It just felt like Laravel was heavy and it, like, I, I don't know, it, it seemed like the same amount of work for me just to kind of go and build, you know, whatever service I kind of needed in the back end myself over trying to adapt into like, you know, what, what they did in that ecosystem. But, but I also assume it's getting better because it's gotten far more popular in the last three years. Yeah. I would say like, absolutely. Like from, you know, we've gotten Laravel nine, 10 and 11 since mm-hmm. I started at clever. So lots of new development on it. There's been serious changes to the framework there and lots of ecosystem stuff to go around it. One of the things I've been playing with recently is um, Laravel Blueprint, uh, which is made by the same devs that came up with Laravel Shift. And Shift is basically a script tool for like, hey, you're on Laravel 7 and you need to update to 9. Like, we'll try to auto-update all the breaking changes in there for you kind of thing. But they came out with this uh, uh, library called Blueprint, and it's really nice. It lets you basically template out in a YAML file, your model structure, your relationships, your controller methods, you can customize the stubs and then you run blueprint build and it stubs out your interesting wow. from a YAML file. And so mm-hmm. what's nice about that, and it does like an erase build iteration loop. So very early on working with the team or initial product requirements, it's kind of cool to be able to iterate in a single YAML file. that's very readable even for non-developers for the most part and say like, here's the domain structure of how we're thinking about this application and be able to just spin up all that boilerplate in seconds. And they go, oh, you know what? Actually, we need another model. We want to change this relationship this way. Erase it, redo it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been a really cool way to accelerate velocity um, at the beginning of a project. And between that and some of the built-in you know, auth, auth and user management functionality and API token and CSRF token management and all that kind of stuff, you get to functional app pretty quick now with the the CLI tooling and and Breeze and some of their other starter kits that you have options to kind of configure. Yeah. So, but I do agree it does feel heavy and I again coming from like an embedded hardware background, I always in my first uh, you know, JavaScript ecosystem experience was writing stuff in Node Express like, yeah. you know, you're not even using Next or anything like that. Right. Um, and even at that point, I at one point built a completely vanilla JS web server with just the n- native Node HTTP library just so I could understand okay, I'm getting this magic from Express or Next or whatever the next framework is. What is it really doing, though? Yeah. I don't like trusting magic if I don't understand the magic. I need to know <laughs> how the trick works. I need to know where the rabbit goes in the hat, you know? Um, and that is, I, I will say that's tricky in Laravel, but I think not not any more so than what I've experienced in my limited playing with Django or Rails mm-hmm. as, as similar frameworks where, like, the magic is there to speed you up as a developer early on, but that also means there's often a lot of, like, pretty heavy abstraction happening under the hood that can be hard to kind of debug and follow through compared to what you built from the ground up. So I think there's always trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong. PHP is a interpreted language. Is that right? So, and and you said you've been working in Rust a lot, which is a compiled language and Rust is one where they have a pretty amazing compiler, right? It is the nicest I've ever used. Yeah. So do you want to, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about, 
like what what your do you have any hot takes on interpreted versus compiled or or you know and even rust versus like c where like rust compiler is a plus and you know you have like three or four different c compilers and none of them i would say none are a plus <laughs> and don't get me started on c plus uh, plus either i that language early on for that reason and no, no shade to the c and c plus plus devs out there they have their place for all sure. the shade <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i mean again i come back to kind of my earlier statement about like uh project preferences trumping personal ones but uh, I have definitely come to the conclusion over the last couple of years that my personal preferences are for a compiled language and a strongly statically typed one. So Rust is kind of really my like love child. But I also do see when I switch back into PHP or JavaScript, you know, or TypeScript, the the sort of there is a in a nice little interpreted scripted language where you're not dealing with and a dynamically loosely typed one on top of it, like it's kind of fun to go in there and scribble and just produce something quickly and not have to overthink it too much. But right. it, yeah. there becomes a point of complexity at which that becomes painful for me, where I'm like, yeah. okay, cool. I scribbled that together real quick, but something isn't working. And I don't have any valid type assertions to follow for that. I don't have a compiler to help me out with that. Um, and with Rust, it's the antithesis of that, to your point. Uh, it's I, I'm a test-driven development guy most of the time. In Rust, it's actually compiler-driven development. Most of the time, if I can get if I can get the compiler ha to be happy, my code usually runs. You know, and and so. no, I mean that that's exactly it. You said uh, t uh, TDD, and really, if you have some tests and it's compiling in Rust, you can be pretty sure that you you've hit the mark right. Yeah, like, it's gonna work. And you don't you don't even really need a whole lot of functional testing at at that stage, which is really nice uh, about it. But yeah, I'll tell you, you brought up TypeScript, and TypeScript is funny, right? Because it's like the effort to try to put strong typing into a dynamically typed language. But the the sad thing about it is that it's um, you know it's linting, right? Mm -hmm. It's not really strongly typed, and so like you're working in TypeScript and you have these types in there, but then at runtime, that may not actually be the type that right. it, that it is. And you're, so you're only getting build time help really from it. For that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When you transpile or, or, um, so anyway, yeah. I, I think that's great. So you also mentioned that you're in Vue and you also have done react. And so, you know, we're, we're, we have a developer here. I want to talk about this stuff. What's your thought on virtual Dom versus straight Dom edits? Like Vue is straight Dom edits that's, and that's, React is a virtual DOM. So Vue actually still is using a virtual DOM under the hood, even though it's fine-grained reactivity in theory. It's, they are working on, there is a, I can't remember the name of the library right now, but they have a core project under R&D right now that is migrating their current VDOM diffing engine into direct DOM updates. Um, I have gotten really interested in that because of the work I've been doing in Rust on my personal site. I'm using a framework called Leptos in Rust, which does all fine-grained closure-based reactivity with direct DOM updates and no VDOM. Mm. And uh, you can imagine with Rust's borrow checker and the strictness of all that typing and result and option types and all of that, that you, having to actually think about fine-grained reactivity at the level Rust wants to make you think about it is makes you really understand how it works. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate that transparency. But I can also think of like, Again, you know, throwing shade, some of my really front end heavy dev friends who would look at that amount of logic and typing just to you know, render out a div and, and think I was crazy for doing it. Um, and they, they're not wrong about some of that. Um, but, but I, you know, when I first started um, you know, in software, again, you know, about, I guess about four years ago now, um, I, you know, I've, I've always really liked JavaScript. I'm a big React guy. Mm -hmm. You know, I still still love React. If I was going to build something today, I'd probably choose React. But um, the more I've learned, the more that I've I've realized that with things, even if you're using a TypeScript, a React, um, I've never used Vue, but I, I've got to imagine, you know, there's some of this that you end up getting so um, dependency heavy that um, you're, you're, you know, we, we, we talked about like Laravel, right? It mm -hmm. feels bulky, it feels heavy. Mm -hmm. Well, the great thing about JavaScript is it's supposed to be light, but you end up adding like 40 plug, you know, packages and dependencies in, and all of a sudden, you know, um, we, we, we had a project that we had worked on together. This was a few years ago, but I remember, I, I don't know if you remember this, but we had an issue with the, the CSS, one of the CSS packages um, dependencies was out of date and out of sync with the overall, you know, CSS package. 
and it, it it would fail to compile. We had to like dig through these node modules, go find this one place to go do this one update, you know. And you, I mean, you just end up carrying all this bulk. And so I've I've really shifted over the last year to trying to keep things as light as possible. And you might have to type out a lot in something like a Rust to get that div. But the great thing to me is when you're not trying to work with 70 different dependencies that all have their own thousand lines of code you're just you know your your future maintenance your architecture is just going to be a lot easier to move that application forward in time you know what i mean mm -hmm. for sure yeah i i definitely i i tend to fight off dependencies with a stick at every turn regardless yeah. of the language or framework i'm working in I always ask myself, why are we why are we adding the dependency, and what does it really buy us, and mm -hmm. what are the costs? Again, it's always trade offs, right? Right. And so, I my general stance tends to be kind of in line with what you were saying, and I tend to to home roll stuff that is actually custom to the app, and lean into dependencies for things that are really solved problems, like yeah. user management and authentication. I'm not going to roll an, an OAuth two client from scratch anymore. Right. That's a solved problem in every language. Right. And whatever you write is going to be slightly worse than whatever that good client is out there because they've already found the bugs you haven't found in your own code. Right. Yeah. So try to lean into the dependencies for the sol the really solved problems that have been well iterated on, where those those libraries and dependencies have you know thousands or tens of thousands of GitHub stars and, mm -hmm. and see active development and regular commits happening to them so you know they're being maintained. Anything that hasn't seen a commit in three years, I'm going to be real sketchy about adding to that manifest you know, and that kind of thing. Um, and anything that, you know, I've seen lots of projects where entire component libraries have been added because you needed a date picker. And it's like, mm, maybe we could have just rolled our own date exactly. picker if that's all you needed was the date picker. But now mm -hmm. we have this entire chunk of component registration happening and all this stuff that doesn't, doesn't need to be there. So I definitely... Try to bias for light, but also try to not reinvent wheels. Yeah. I think that's kind of the, the sweet spot. No, you're hitting right on the head. That's exactly what I think every developer should do. <clears throat> I, I'm actually in the opposite camp on that. I don't, I, if someone else has already written something and it works, then, and it does 90% of what I want it to do, then I, I'm, I'm willing to bridge that 10% gap to not have to write the 90. Um, you know, but, but there is a lot of vetting involved, like mm -hmm. you said, you know, and, and my, my rule of thumb is that, you know, if, if you're under a thousand GitHub stars, then I'm probably not interested mm -hmm. in what you've written just mm -hmm. because not enough people have been banging on it, right? Like to, to find the errors. And then another thing that I really like to do is to look through the issues. And mm -hmm. if issues are getting closed, if issues are getting worked on, then that usually gives me some confidence. But like, I, I, I am going to spend extra time trying to find the package that solves 90% of my problem rather than start on, on home rolling something because I, and, and I think my perspective is you kind of hit on it is that I am not going to be able to pay attention to this small piece of the, of the overall project to the same level that someone is just trying to solve this one problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so whatever I end up writing is likely not going to be as tested not going to be as complete. And, and but I mean, I, I, and I fully take your point about the bringing in a huge dependency to solve one little problem, you know, so like, like you said, I think it's trade-offs, but I think my, my, where I land is that I, I don't want to try to reinvent the wheel every time I, I, I want to build a car, right? I'm like, well, there are a lot of good tire manufacturers Absolutely. out there, you know, so, I, I mean, but I mean, it, different strokes, it's, it's, I don't think that one is right or one is wrong. I think you're exactly right that it's trade-offs, you know, and, and, and if you can correctly, I, and I think what you had said, I really agree with, which is that you need to be able to articulate why am I bringing in this dependency, right? Yeah. And that to me yeah. is, is, is huge. So, um, I, I, <clears throat> I have another question about Rust because I, I like Rust too. I, I spent maybe, a year kind of digging into it, wrote some HTTP stuff from scratch, and then also used some of their frameworks. Um, and and I, lo I love it too. It's just, it feels like even now, even with all sorts of developers endorsing it, with everybody, every developer that works in it saying that they love it and they want to work in it more, it still is just not really achieving any mainstream su success or being used at, at any, you know, high level enterprise applications. So, um, you know, if, if you have some ideas about why that is, or if you want to maybe talk about like the future of Rust and where you see it going, I think that would be really interesting. I, I've been really curious. I've been trying to kind of watch that also and have a, a pretty similar assessment to what you said. I think some of the things I've seen recently that have kind of caught my eye, uh, not necessarily to the enterprise end, but 
uh, several like core Linux tools like grep, for instance, have been like, if you haven't used rip grep yet, you should all be using rip grep at this point. Don't even need to know rust, just install the binary. It is orders of magnitude faster than the original C grep and how they're writing command line tooling like that, that is actually running faster than the native C tooling still boggles my mind just a little bit, but like that's, that's one area where I'm seeing a lot of like the, and, and, uh, Linus himself actually has said that he would accept like that rust in the Linux kernel is now an option that like the extensions exist for that. So I think on the lower systems level, which often doesn't get the same visibility as the sort of more large enterprise traction that you're seeing, the, the project I saw most recently on a, on a more publicly visible level is turbo pack that got me kind of interested, right? Which is like. Vite is such a, I'm, I'm, I am going to throw shade here, Vite is so far vastly superior to Webpack as a tool to deal with as a build tool. And it was clear that, you know, Webpack's creators and that the team that's now working on TurboPack kind of was like, we're not going to fix Webpack, we're just going to start over and write it in Rust. And now we'll be faster than Vite, yeah. like, and that's the, the stance. So I do think, like, there are better use cases for Rust than others, right? Like, if, if memory safety is absolutely critical, that's a use case for Rust. If at, squeezing every last bit of performance out of limited resources, that's a use case for Rust, but I think part of the limitation for it that's that's hindering its you know traction in in major enterprise entities, the developer learning curve is steep. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I had somebody once describe it to me as S shaped, and I think that's really accurate. You start playing with Rust, and you're like, oh, this is really cool. This is a really neat language, and then you run into the borrow checker for the first time, and you're yep. like, what is this memory <laughs> management paradigm I've never used in any other language? <laughs> it's like sort of references and sort of pointers yeah. and sort of not and i don't have to malloc and free but i do have to actually think about memory yeah and, and i have to tell the compiler like how long am i like wh what's the lifetime, lifetime. of this variable exactly. that, that that i'm and and it, and it turns into part of the signature of mm -hmm. the of the function so no I, I i completely agree you have to really it it as a language and part of why i chose to do it outside of my web work is that it really does force you to actually like think about memory management but and performance and do so in a way that doesn't require you to actually manually allocate and free the memory, which is the source of so many leaks in C and C++ code, right. right? And so like, those are good use cases for it, but you, you kind of reach the top of that S curve. And once you finally understand the borrow check, you're like, oh, I can program again. I remember how to code, I'm not an idiot, but there's this big chunk in the yeah. middle that I think unless you, as, a, as an enterprise level company or somebody with a large development team that is not Rust native already, if you're looking at Rust as an option, you have to be see the payoff for that cost of like, okay, all of our developers are gonna get way slower for a minute. And also we're gonna need developers who wanna think about memory management and type mm -hmm. safety. Like your average vanilla JavaScript developer is gonna hate Rust. The ones that yeah. talk about loving it are the ones that come from TypeScript yeah. because they get a lot of what they get out of applying TypeScript to JavaScript, except it actually makes it to runtime. It actually yeah. lands in the compiler. Right. Um, and TypeScript has always felt a little applied to me. My, I, yeah, it, it is. It's 51% better than using JavaScript without it. Yeah, and, and you know, <laughs> another use case that I would mention is concurrency, which is, um, mm -hmm. you know, another thing that the borrow checker just yeah. makes amazing for, for yep. writing concurrent code, you know, yep. a async. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Matt. Go ahead. No, no, that no, that's really good. Yeah, I, I was just going to say I... Yeah, I used to be really heavy on TypeScript in the beginning, and um, it's a really good tool out there. Any developers listening to this, you should check it out. It's called Front End Masters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they just, it's a bunch of guys from a lot of the big fang companies who just want to teach good software, and uh, really, really good lessons in there. But uh, there's one, um, it's, you know, you don't know JS, and he basically just makes a whole argument about if you're using TypeScript, and you know, right out of the box, just the way that it is, you're you're not really saving yourself anything. Mm -hmm. like, like you know, you're just you're 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 just applying rules. They're, it's not a framework. It's just it's a it's a bunch of heavy rules, and they're really rules that standard practice said you probably shouldn't have been doing anyway, right? And so I've I've started to lean away from from TypeScript, but I have actually done a little bit in Rust over the last couple of months. So it's been great to hear you guys talk about it because I I personally think that the learning curve is steep, but at the end of the day, I like a software where they had a vision, they're they're executing that vision and that vision is not to make my life as a developer easier, it's to make my end product better. And that's what it, Rust feels like to me. That you know, it, it it's it's making that end product that that software that you're writing sound, and, and it's going to stand the test of time. I think you know yeah, if you're doing it there for sure. When I was looking at systems languages to try to like do some more lower level stuff outside of my web things, I was I had narrowed it down into the modern paradigms to Go and Rust. Yeah, and and then 
Go prioritizes developer velocity and web, and they do it very well. Um, Rust prioritizes language solidity, right? Mm -hmm. And forced backwards compatibility for stable versions and all of that sort of stuff. And so the Rust community very much cares about Rust being what they think is a solid language and not so much about how fast you can build an app with it. And that is not the stance of Go. And that's not that today one is better than the other for any given reason, but like yeah. I actually wanted exactly what Rust is providing there. So. Well, <clears throat> it's been amazing having you on. The time flew and we're coming up to the end. Um, is there anywhere that people can find you, any social media or anything that, that you want to shout out or any, any projects that you want to bring attention to? I mean, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm in the currently in the process of uh, porting my blog over, so that'll get published back up. It currently exists on an old Gatsby site that I built a while ago, but it's currently be getting rebuilt in Rust, so it'll take somewhere between a week and a year, depending <laughs> on how long it takes me to figure out web and Rust. But yeah. Uh, um, uh, that's Tales from the Mountain, and that'll be up, and I think it's linked on my LinkedIn profile, and, and I'm on GitHub. And other than that, I, I tend to actually dodge the social media these days. I think my theater time gave me enough exposure to the, the public and the world for 20 years. I am, and I've, uh, I, I'm, on, I'm on X now. I keep wanting to call it Twitter uh, <laughs> and Facebook, but I do not, um, you know, I'm not super active on those at the moment. Respect yeah. it. I respect it. Yeah, I, I'm the same. I'm off everything except for LinkedIn, which I only yep. keep for work. Yeah, if you actually want me to pay attention to it, it, LinkedIn is a better place to find me or actually, you know, come talk to me, email me, whatever. So Absolutely. It's so great to have another developer on. We're definitely going to have to do this soon. Thank you so much, Eric, Kyle. And if you're looking for him, Kyle is actually K-I-E-H-L, correct? Uh, it's K-E-I-L. K-E-I-L. We, we joke in our family that that is our last name is Kyle, K-E-I-L. You have to say it, pronounce it, and spell it because nobody will ever get the two <laughs> right. So, <laughs> yeah. It's the German thing. <laughs> so if you're looking for him on LinkedIn, find him there. Thank you so much, Eric. Man, we really appreciate Thanks, having guys. you here. Thanks, guys. It's been great. Yeah. Been great. Thanks, man.